So our speaker for today is uh, Mac Stoken, and this is uh, his master's project uh, directed by Dr. Uh, Brent Seals. Okay, and the uh, the title is uh, uh, the blockchain breakdown. Uh, I don't. You, most of you probably know that blockchain is new technology that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, secure, that ensures your, you know, a secure system that can be, you know, shared by all the participants, okay? You don't have to worry about it. Uh, well, anyway, it's a secure system, okay? Uh, Mac will present his experience of this new technology. He will present a uh, a lot of useful information for us to share. So let's go from uh, Meg Stoke. This is going to be a 50 minutes talk. So as Dr. Chang said, my name is Max Stoke, and I am a master's student here at UK. He also mentioned I'm under Dr. Steele's. Last semester, I had the opportunity to do an independent study with Dr. Steele's, and um, we decided the topic would be blockchain, and he thought, we thought it would be a good idea to come in here and kind of talk to you guys about what I learned, what I read last semester. So I'm kind of, um, how this is going to go is I'm going to, how this is going to go is I'm going to, How this is going to go is I'm going to um, kind of explain what blockchain is, kind of where it originated from, and um, kind of review some of the papers I read, some of the topics I looked at, look at some of the software that I also um, got to use, and that, um, yeah, so, so basically we have to ask what is blockchain? So blockchain is basically a distributed ledger shared amongst a network of computer nodes. Um, how the ledger works is this data is collected and stored in blocks. And these blocks are linked together using cryptography, so the hash of the previous block is included in the um, current block. And um, this makes the data immutable, meaning new data can be appended to the block, um, to the chain, but it is never written over. So when, once a transaction, once a, um, a group of transactions are collected, they're put into a block and they are stored onto the blockchain, but it does not overwrite any previous data. That's one of the um, important things, so it's able to, so, um, anyone is able to go back and look at previous transactions. Um, it is considered decentralized, meaning there is no central authority. It is a peer, it is strictly a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and this is, it was originally, originally created in cryptocurrency. Um, I'm sure you all heard of Bitcoin, I will get into that, but, um, but as it has um, evolved over these um, years, um, it, people are starting to realize the true potential that it has and how it can and how it has really changed the industries that it's being used in. So I'm actually, so when we start to talk about the um, genesis of blockchain, I'm actually going to start with a paper called How to Timestamp a Digital Document. Because unbeknownst to me, when I first started this study, I thought, you know, reading the Bitcoin paper, because I originally thought that's where um, um, the whole blockchain idea originated from. But after I read it and also read another paper, uh, read an article to kind of give me more idea on blockchain, um, I was directed to this paper, written in 1991 by Stuart Haber and W. Scott um, that it wasn't considered blockchain at the time, but it, um, once you read it, which I um, show you some of the things they, the techniques that they used was where um, the Bitcoin author was inspired to create blockchain. So um, the goal or the reason for this paper was they wanted to um, verify when a digital document is last modified or created. This was back in 1991 when the rise of you know, technology was starting to be prominent. So they were worried about, you know, it was very easy to go in and tamper, um, tamper any, any online or digital document. So they were saying, how can we properly timestamp this document and make sure that it's accurate? 
Um, they presented it a naive solution, and then they kind of built on top of that. And basically, their naive solution was something you can consider as a digital safety deposit box where you send a document to a time stamping service or a TSS. Um, they time stamp it, or it time stamps it, a copy is saved, and then um, the client receives the document back with the timestamp. Um, but there were some issues with privacy, bandwidth, and trust. It's like, can we really trust the central authority, or can we rely solely on the central authority? So what they did was they created this network or system. And as I said, this is where some of you can see that some of the um, blockchain techniques originated from. So for example, for the start, they, um, they to set up this network, it is a, a network of nodes, which are basically clients, and each client has a unique identification number. number. And um, they use, um, they start, this is where they realize cryptography is the best place to use so that you don't just send in a plain text and so your data is perfectly hidden. They also use digital signatures to verify the users and senders. And then I'm also going to go into detail about linking and distributed trust, which were two things they um, talked about in the paper, and this is um, where Uber Bitcoin got their ideas from. So basically linking, when you have a digital document and you send it into the TSS, and it is digitally signed, but once um, the certificate is signed, it includes bits from the previous sequence of clients. So a certificate um, consists of the sequence number, the time, the ID, Y event is the current hash, and then the linking information. And the linking information, as you can see, is basically all the information that came before it. Um, they present two variants. Um, and one of the variants, you just, the linking information is just composed of all the data before it. But in another variation, you link each request to the, um, it's just a previous, the previous K request. So, um, so instead of just one, so just the immediate certificate before, you um, have a list of certificates before the current one. And after, and the client who sent in the original, um, the client who sent in the original, who sent in their document will receive a signed certificate as long as the next ID um, in the chain. So that way, if there is a challenger who challenges a document or a time stamp, they can go back and you can see this chain. You can verify the ones that came before and the ones that came after. You can verify that the timestamp was accurate. Um, the other technique they introduced was called distributed trust, where um, you put in the hash, the document's hash, into a pseudo random generator and you can produce a tuple of a certain number of client IDs. And um, each um, the original client sends the do hash document as well as their ID. And then each, um, each of the clients that were generated sends back a signed message um, with the timestamp, the ID, and also the hash. And so the timestamp of that document that the first client sent in is composed of what they sent and all of the signatures. Um, and the reason why this is considered a, um, why they consider this a valid um, method is because you would need um, K amount of clients who are cooperating to make a fake timestamp ban, which is computationally difficult. They do talk about what would be, what would the, um, optimal number of K would be, but I'm not really sure what that is, but either way, so they trust that the people who are sending back these certificates or sending back um, the side messages are valid. And so using these kind of techniques is where we lead to the Bitcoin paper, which was written by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008. This is what kind of kicked off the whole blockchain craze and, or, yeah, blockchain craze and how it basically been built on top of. So originally, um, 
what they were wanting to do was create a cash system based on cryptographic proof without the use of a third party because they didn't want to have to go through a third party because they didn't know if it was trustworthy or not, but they felt that as a peer-to-peer -peer network, there would be more trustworthy to build off transactions and um, to build transactions. And so basically, once you have this network of honest nodes, and as you can see below, um, a block, and I'll get more into this in the next few slides, but you have a block of transactions, that's what TX stands for, and once enough transactions are built into or stored into a block, um, they're stored into a block and then they're hashed, and then the previous hat, and then it gets cryptographically linked to the next block in the chain. And um, why this, this is a good system is because um, you, in order for an attacker to in order for an attacker to um, take over the system or try and take over the system, there's something called the 51% attack, and they would need to control the majority of the nodes in the system. But you know, given how big blockchains can grow, it's not exactly possible. And once you try and tamper with any block in the previous chain, it's going to mess up. It's going to be very obvious that this is being messed with because the cryptographic hashes won't match anymore. So how transactions work in this paper, um, when we talk about transactions, it kind of depends on what kind of system you're using. Especially in cryptocurrencies, um, in cryptocurrency, you know, transaction would be people agreeing to um, trade assets and trade bitcoins or trade the crypto. But in other cases, the transaction might not actually mean a transaction. It just might mean a new block being added to the chain. So in the Bitcoin white paper, they talk about that a chain of digital signatures, it makes up a, an electronic coin. And you can use this to kind of trade with people and, like I said, make transactions. But what they were worried about was something called the double spending problem. It's like when you use a coin, how do you know that coin wasn't already spent before? So basically, it's a problem of using the same coin in two different instances. So this is where they get the idea to make it the, all the transactions known to everybody in the network so everyone is aware. That's where the public ledger comes in. Every, the data is available to everyone who's participating. And they also need to agree on a single order of transactions. There might be, you know, multiple, when multiple nodes try and get on at one time, or if some camp or some attacker were to come in, um, in order to agree on a system, in order to have a peer-to-peer -peer network that does not depend on an authority, you need to have a single order of transactions that, okay, this is the order we're going to use, this is the value, this is the value, um, sorry, this is the real letter, and anything else is not. Um, so, so yeah, like I said, um, once the block is formed, then the hash, it gets hashed to the next block. Um, and how the blocks get added onto the blockchain is something called a proof of work. There are different methods um, you can use to add the block on. But the most popular one is called the proof of work. Basically, this is protection against any um, dishonest node wanting to be added to the um, chain. Basically, what you do, what, what they want to do is this: um, they they use a kind of a brute force to find a specific hash value, and to find a and when that value is hashed, there should be a certain leading number of zeros on it. And so once the computer has put in enough work, they realize, okay, this is a valuable, it kind of is like they earn their right to be added to the network. So once that enough work is done, this block can be added to the chain. Um, and so how that works is, um, there has to be a certain amount of steps. So at first, um, a new transaction, like I said, needs to be broadcast to all of the computer nodes so that everyone is made aware of it. And then it, each, transact, each node stores that transaction into a block. And then each node tries to look for the right um, proof of work problem that the new block needs to solve and to get mined. That's what, kind of, that's what Bitcoin mining is, is when you do that proof of work and you put in enough effort or work to get added to the blockchain. And if all transactions are valid in the block, it will be appended and then this cycle just continues and continues. Um, so
So um, this is basically the process of how, in fact, this is mainly for the Bitcoin paper. This is also similar for other processes as well, but just to um, reiterate, this was just how the Bitcoin white paper had um, labeled it out, or had laid it out. And then there's also the concern of incentive. Basically, incentive means like, why should nodes support this chain? Why should we put in the work to add a block to this chain? And in cryptocurrencies, that's probably obvious. It's like, you know, you get a certain value back for the amount of Bitcoin that you mine. But in other cases, um, and it also helps increase the number of honest nodes onto the network and have a more secure system. Um, but like I said, in other cases, um, that it's going to be different. Um, I'll get to one example from the papers I read. I'll get to one of those examples as to what their incentive is. But basically, incentive is like why, um, maybe because you need a reason to have people put in their computing power and add blocks to the chain. So now I'm going to lead to, so like I said, I had read some, so basically this independent study that I did with Dr. Seals, I had the opportunity to read some, some articles on blockchain. And one of the things I was kind of inspired by or wanted to look at is how other places were using blockchain. Because I knew, I had heard that blockchain was a disruptive technology and it was changing how we operate or how businesses operate. But I was like, I'm not really sure how, how they're doing that. So I kind of want to look at some examples. And so one of the first papers I read was called A Systematic Literature Review of Blockchain-Based Applications, um, Current Status, Classification, and Open Issues. I was more interested into how they classify these blockchain applications. And so the authors created a talk, um, a taxonomy of blockchain applications, and they split it off into 10 categories. And I have some examples, and I have listed the 10 categories out. I kind of had to separate that. Um, there's just so much, like there's just so many examples. Like what I have here isn't even a fraction of how many things they were able to find. So I have just some examples. Do you have the year of the paper? Go back to What's the year? Huh? What's the year of this paper? Um, got I believe it was 2014, 23. I did forget to put that on there, but. Was um, actually, I believe it was 2019. Is when it was written. 2019. I think it was 2019. But um, so anyway, so the first one again, probably more well known one is the financial applications. Um, the thing about big or blockchain is it is expected to play a role in influence the development of the global economy, the current banking system, and society as a whole. And um, you know, it can be used in stuff like digital payments, loan management schemes, banking services, and also financial auditing. Um, there's also the second um, um, category they, they found was integrity verification. So this could be used in stuff like products and services lifetime. So you have the insurance and intellectual property management. And here are some examples of um, solutions dealing with that, so there was fact up which is a digital asset storage. Uh, media chain can link digital content with creators, and it uses the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, I'm also gonna get into that, that you know, there's certain blockchains where you can kind of build on top of them and use them as a platform to build applications. One of the more popular ones is Ethereum. It was designed specifically for that. But like I said, I will get into that later. But um, there's also Everledger, which is used for fraud prevention for banks and insurance companies. Uh, the third um, topic is governance, and you, know, you can use, um, in this one, they found solutions for registration of legal documents, such as, you know, identification, taxes, you know, marriage contracts, and also voting. Um, there is something called the World of Citizens Project, which is a decentralized passport service. By the way, they didn't really, um, they didn't necessarily go into a lot of details about like how or like how these were necessarily set up. They just gave like examples, but I just wanted to show you all the different uses that they laid out and um, that they put in this paper because I thought it was interesting to see that you know you, you don't have to move blockchain just for cryptocurrency. It can be used for it's mainly it can be also as like a sort of database. Think of it as a sort of database. Like when you add stuff on, 
Um, you know, you can look at past data, but like it's a since blockchain or yeah, blockchain is considered is considered secure because it's very it's very tamper proof. It's why people are starting to look at this like, hey, we can use this to protect our own data. And so stuff like um, you know your passport or any important document, you want them to be secure. You don't want that to be hacked. Sure. You know, you keep using the, the, the term tamper proof. What does that mean? It means that like it's very difficult for anyone to go back through the chain and tamper and like change the data or over because the data in the blockchain is only appended to, it is never overwritten. And so because each um, block is cryptographically hashed, if someone were to want to go back and change that, it would be very difficult. Because not only would they all the proof of work, all the proof of work would have to be redone, not only for that current block, but also all the blocks after it. And also the hashes would be changed. So once you change, because the hash that is used in the next block is based on the data in the current block. So if they were to go back and change that data, all the nodes would look at it and say, hey, we have a discrepancy here. This, these hashes don't match. So it's very difficult for someone to go back and change it. Does that make sense? So it's very, um, yeah, it's um, very simple. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. It's you know, very it's secure. And so um, they're also starting to use this for voting systems. So they want to try and speed up the voting process. Um, they have something called, there are things, they mentioned something called the Congress and the Democracy, which are decentralized voting systems. Um, the fourth one is Internet of Things. They um, found a symbiotic relationship between, internet, for those of you who don't know, Internet of Things is like using appliances and they kind of are connected to the internet. And they, what they do is, you may not realize it, but they're actually gathering data. As they're do, as they're working, uh, as they're doing their thing, and so because blockchain is helping with big data, there's like this relationship, and you know you can use blockchain to minimize these IoT deficiencies and maximize the potential. Um, and they they mentioned the um, possibility of linking your cryptocurrency accounts to your IoT devices, and. Um, there was something called, um, IBM had created something called the Autonomous Decentralized P2P tele Telemetry, which is a distributed network of devices. Um, the next one is healthcare management. Um, it, so smart contracts is also another thing I'm gonna get into later, but um, to describe it right now, is a smart contract is basically a, a, a program on, that is automatically run on the blockchain when a certain predetermined when certain predetermined conditions are met. So in smart contracts, Ethereum kind of led the thing on that, but ever since smart contracts have been a, have been introduced, people have been using them to build on to use them to build on top of the blockchain. And so you can use these smart contracts for scientific credibility in clinical trials. So you can kind of link, um, you know, how this one trial went, the results of the first trial, and then just keep linking that kind of see the whole order of how that happened. Um, it's also useful for managing electronic healthcare records. Um, it's easy for any, it would be easy for anyone who wants their records stored to kind of look at it and kind of see, you know, their medical history. So that's very important. You want to kind of keep that, not, not only secure, but you also want to keep that available to people so they can kind of see their whole um, history of how they've been doing. And like I said, one of the more important things is the privacy and security is one of the most prominent characteristics. So that's why they're starting to use it in um, their their systems because you know um, because it's sometimes typical. Sorry, I'm just a little thirsty. Um, and so when it comes to stuff like big data, you want to try and keep that secure and any sensitive information, so um, you can enhance the security for that. And here are some examples of um, applications. So it's something called Namecoin. It's a decentralized version of the domain name system, which is like connecting the web browsers to the website. So um, you don't want multiple websites with the same name. So this is a way to, for them to um, have a decentralized way of doing that. Um, there's also something called the Sprint Labs are currently forming the blockchain-based smartphone. Um, not really sure how they're doing that, but I thought that was pretty interesting. And then one of the more interesting things is um, in business and in 
industrial applications supply chain management. So when I first learned about um, blockchain, it was actually at my internship over the summer, you had these um, modules, and you know, if you complete the module, you get some sort of prize, and one of them was blockchain. And I'm like, okay, so I'll look at this, because I knew, I kind of knew about blockchain, but I wasn't so sure about it. And it was kind of interesting, because one of the, um, they kind of showed this video of this woman who was purchasing something, and there was like this thread. I know this sounds weird, but there's like this big piece of yarn that just creating that through all the different places. So it was coffee, the product was coffee, and just led back through all the different stations that um, that this coffee had to go through in order to get to this woman's house. And one of the interesting things they showed was they went all the way back to the farmer in Brazil, and you know she was able to tip that farmer in Brazil using the blockchain that was able to lead all the way through. And I thought that was very interesting. That's probably, so I'm going to move on to the next one. And the next, um, the other, the next category is education. So you can enhance the vulnerability. A lot of these are kind of saying the same thing, just enhancing the security of, of these different platforms. But you can enhance the vulnerability of security and privacy and learning environments. It can also be used to store educational records and learning achievements. Uh, and you know, in this day and age of, you know, after COVID, online learning to enhance the personal learning of yourself. And also, they can, you can also use blockchain in school information hubs mm. to aid in school decisions by analyzing your data. And this is one of the most, like I said, one of the most defining properties of blockchain is data management. Because like I said, you can use, and you, can also, you can kind of see this all throughout the previous categories, is basically they're using this as a sort of database, as a new kind of database. And so this is one of the most defined properties of the blockchain. You can store all this information into it. So it can enhance the data storage and also speed up the selection process. And also, you can also um, incorporate it. So the thing with disruptive technologies is you can kind of combine them and kind of maximize their capabilities. And so you can use cloud-based solutions to help with that. So you can combine cloud. But actually, one of the papers I've got to mention kind of does combine cloud and um, Cloud and blockchain. So, okay. so and also, and also one other one is miscellaneous. Um, this is just anything that didn't fit the first category. So, if you all heard of crowd surfing platforms, it's basically like donations. And those are some examples of cryptocurrency type crowd surfing platforms. Um, there's, you have autonomous transport systems in smart cities as well as event ticket management. And like I said, this isn't even like a fraction of what that paper discussed. It, um, I would highly recommend um, reading that paper and reading all the different types of solutions they have. I believe one I saw was called um, um, trans Trading Transmission Links for Pollution. I, it's something to kind of come back to pollution in some way. I'm not really sure, but I thought that was interesting. I mean, there's just a lot of things that I didn't even really think about. Okay, so as you all know, Dr. Seals is working on a project that basically talks about preserving cultural heritage. He's trying to take these certain artifacts and kind of study them and review them and see what they, you know, like he takes scrolls, but he doesn't want to damage them, so he has to analyze them to see what the pictures are actually saying. So he had asked me if there was anything related to cultural heritage in blockchain. And so I'm going to look at some papers dealing with that. Um, so basically, this, what we're talking about is intangible cultural heritage. Basically, it basically just is anything like processes, artifacts, and anything that deals with the persons um, that people consider a part of their heritage. And ever since the 1990, okay. and ever since the 1990s, there has been a wave of digitization to kind of preserve these. Um, having them stored in like some sort of a building wasn't, you know, that wasn't very secure. So they wanted to digitize and create something called digital twins. Basically, that just means, you know, say you have a, a sculpture, you can just take a picture of it. It's not the actual thing, but it's like it represents, it's the digital form of that artifact. And due to this, you know, there are security risks that come about. And because of that, you know, people want to preserve their culture as much as possible. So they want to find ways to make it secure. So with this paper, um, so this paper wanted to look into blockchain to 
kind of have its um, protect against any malicious attackers. Um, and because the you know, ICH is often in the form of large files, so what they do is um, they encrypt or they have it put it through a hash function, and that's how they store on the block. That's how you can create a fingerprint. And one thing. One thing that I had kind of mentioned was this elliptic curve algorithm that um, I didn't really see any other paper talk about this, but they had, so this is why I decided to mention it, was the elliptic curve algorithm. But they didn't really go into much detail about how it actually works, but they gave this formula. And so you can use this function in encryption and the digital science, so you can create a digital signature. And what this can do is it can produce shorter keys, which loads bandwidth. So when you you have the keys for these certain artifacts, the longer the keys can be, the more time it might take the process. So you can use this um, with the curve algorithm to kind of shorten that. And it's shown to increase operation speed and have a 30% higher performance and lower hardware and software requirements. Um, I'm sure you all know that you know blockchain do, um, heavily uses cryptocurrency, so they're always trying to find faster ways for it. And this one was actually um, this one, the cultural heritage preservation by using blockchain was one of my favorite solutions because I found it very unique. So basically, they realized there was a connection between cultural heritage preservation and tourism. They basically defined three layers. First of all, what they used that was kind of different than any other solution I've seen was they use a peer-to-peer -peer network using mobile phones. You know, typically mobile phones don't really have computing power, but with the way they um, with the way they did it, they were able to kind of get it on the map. I have a picture on the next slide. They kind of have this peer-to-peer -peer network um, on computers. Now, things like I said, when you have these ICH files, these um, cultural heritage files are very large. So what they do is they have like the actual file stored onto a cloud, and they use their hash to connect that to the block that the block represents. And um, the consensus there basically, you know, like I said, they just use they use proof of work. Like I said, there are other methods, but the thing about proof of work is it's very dynamic. So like I said, they were they needed to lower the bandwidth, lower the amount of power. So um, proof of work, you know, for example, when I said you can find a hash value that produces a number of zeros, you can lower that number of zeros. So that's why I decided to use the proof of work. Um, and the incentives layer, basically they use something that's called con contributionware software, where you exchange your smartphone's power for digital tokens, and you can use those tokens for digital, um, for cultural goods such as, um, or services. And this is, you know, advertised by nonprofit organizations, so like, Cultural goods might mean a catalog, and like services might mean museum passes. So they're trying to find a way for people who are like historical buffs, or people who are <clears throat> really into you know anthropology, to kind of they were trying to use them, trying to advertise to them, saying, hey, if you help us with this, you can get rewarded. So this is basically what that looks like. You have the actual files stored in the cloud, um, and then you can see they're connected to the blocks on the blockchain using cryptographic hash. And that is um, that is on the peer to peer network using mobile phones, and you know once you support the network, you can get rewarded with digital tokens. Like I said, I thought that was a very unique solution because I every paper I read never dealt with mobile phones because, like I said, they, they want high they need high computing power. And also, I thought the digital I thought it was kind of interesting how they were trying to combine you know these two separate worlds of cultural heritage and blockchain. So I really I kind of like. <clears throat> and now, this was also one of my um, other favorite solutions because, again, I found it very unique. It also kind of helped me understand um, how what, what they meant by like a computer network. Like, I knew what they meant, but like this kind of helped me um, really understand that. So this is this is a thing called Big Chain uh, 2.0, and it takes benefits from both blockchain and database capabilities. And so they have a system of nodes like usual, but what they so what they do is each um, node has its own local MongoDB database, and each one is a copy of the other nodes. Um, like I said, this is 2.0, so it kind of builds on top of their first solution. 
and they wanted to make it Byzantine's fault tolerant. That basically means that if one node were to fail, then the network should, should still be able to run. So, when, so basically, if an attacker were to attack one of the nodes in this network, it would only mess with that copy. All the other copies on the other nodes would still be intact. Um, and they convert, um, the transactions are done in JSON strings, which I have an example of that. And, um, and they, it, they convert it to their own object called a spec, and they each have their own keys and values. They use the HTTP API to send these transactions, and they arrive at this web server. And, you know, a lot of these papers, like I said, they basically talk about what blockchain is, but I'll spare you all those details because, you know, I don't want to explain it each time because, you know, but a lot of the papers, they do go into detail about what blockchain actually is. But, so that's why I decided to kind of take out what they did instead of going to how they use blockchain. And um, one of the advantages, um, like I said, it's immutable, as we know with blockchain. Any blockchain application is immutable. The owner is controlled assets. Again, I'll go into... I would get to that, and then there's a high transaction rate because some crypto, some blockchains, like for instance, Bitcoin, takes like 10 minutes per block to be added. Where other, and so that's kind of a problem if you want to like have things done efficiently. So there's a high transaction rate and there's low latency that goes along with that. And here are some uses for, like I mentioned, digital twins. I mentioned Internet of Things, supply chain management. This is one of their use cases for that. And this is kind of what that network looks like. As you can see, each node is set up with their own MongoDB, um, their own web API, and other kind of things. You can see how they're all connected. And like I said, it's interesting because if one of these nodes were to fail, the others would still have a copy of the ledger. So this is what one of their transactions looks like. So for example, um, there's the create trans um, there's a create function and also a There's the create transaction and also the transfer operation. Basic create just means you create an asset. So the example they gave was, say Joe Lunch created a thousand Joe Bucks. He could do that using, he could do that, and then he has the rights to those assets. And you can see in the, um, in what I have over here, it has the input, so it's like, who is the owner before this? You can see that one of the, um, any input is like who was the owner before, and as you can see, it's all hashed, so you don't know exactly who it is, so it can be secure. And then you have the output is who is getting this afterwards, and the operation is create. And when you have the transfer operation, you basically give those assets to someone. So, say Joe wanted to give 37 Joe Bucks to Lisa. Well, there'd be two outputs one would be that Lisa got those 37 Joe Bucks, and she is now the owner of those, whereas Joe now has 37 less than that, and he's now the asset to only, to only those. Okay, now I'm going to get into smart contracts. Smart contracts are, I find them very fun because, like I said, without them, you really wouldn't. Smart, smart contracts allow you to kind of build on top of the blockchain. And basically, what kind of started the smart, so Bitcoin, so, what is Actually, let me start, what is a smart contract? A smart contract is an instance of a computer program that runs on a blockchain and is always random when a certain number of conditions are met. I am going, like, I'm going to show you an example of this because there was a paper I found really interesting as well. Um, and, you know, they contain program code and, you know, account balance. So they just store, they, they used to, like, store information and write it to the blockchain. Um, so basically, like I said, what kind of kicked off was Ethereum. Ethereum saw Bitcoin because Bitcoin has its own scripting language, but there was a lot of issues with it. Like it wasn't Turing complete. Um, there was some discrepancies on who, what kind of data you could see on it. So they didn't really. So what they wanted to do is what they wanted to build on top. They wanted to build a blockchain. Um, they wanted to implement a blockchain with a built-in programming language on top of it. And um, that. So when they first released that paper in like 2014, the, the language was called Serpent, and it was based on Python. You'll see an example of that here in a second. But as of right now, um, Serpent is deprecated. I'm not exactly sure why. 
but now they have a programming language called Solidity, and I had the opportunity, and I kind of had the chance to work with that. I would compare, um, I would compare Solidity to more like Java. Um, it's an object-oriented programming language. Um, you know, it was very, it was, it was pretty neat to work with because it kind of, you can kind of see, and I'll show you some software as well where that gets written. And so, and you have these things on the Ethereum blockchain. They have Ethereum accounts. You know, it comes with a 20 byte address, so each account. Um, is associated with an address. I don't know if I actually explained the nonce yet. I just realized I did. The nonce is like a random number, pretty much. That's kind of what is used for the basis of the proof of work. It's what the value. It's the value they want to get to, pretty much. Um, it also comes with the ether balance. Ether is the um, you know that's the main cryptocurrency on the Ethereum blockchain. But what's cool about Ethereum is and the solidity is they mentioned you can use it to create your own um, sub. There's also the code. Like I said, the code is actually on the blockchain itself. When you write the code and deploy it to the blockchain, it is on the blockchain. And so they um, they describe two things called messages and transactions. The messages are kind of like um, Bitcoin transactions. Instead, you can create in Bitcoin. You can only create a transaction by an external source. But like I said, with these smart contracts, you actually have the ability to make these. These transactions are met. I'm calling them messages. They are basically transactions, even though they have they have their own definition of transactions. Um, and they come. I know. So with transactions, um, it's basically just a data package that stores a message from an externally owned account, and it comes with the recipient and the sender signature, so the digital signature of the sender. And also, it has the ether and the data associated with it. And also, they introduce something called gas. Gas is pretty much like a transaction fee. So when you have code on the blockchain, it's possible you run into an infinite loop, which isn't good. So they have gas and a gas limit. So either once that gas limit is reached or when this person runs out of um, Ethereum, it, it takes, it's taken from the Ethereum account. Um, it's kind of to prevent that from happening, to prevent from depleting resources and having this code go on indefinitely. And this is just some, I kind of found this interesting. These are some denominations of Ethereum. Um, 10 to the 18, which is a huge number. Ether is one way, and certain denominations of that. And so this was also one of the, so this is where, um, this is, and this is where you're going to see some examples of smart contracts. It's um, basically what happened a step by step towards creating a smart contract, unless it's insights from a cryptocurrency lab. So basically, professors from the University of Maryland in an undergraduate security class had their students create their own smart contracts. Um, because the thing is, once you these smart contracts, these smart contracts raise security challenges. Because if you have a buggy contract, you could possibly lose money. No one wants that. Um, so basically, what they do is they define smart contracts using the Ethereum service language. They presented them to the class. Um, the teachers looked at them and found out the issues with them. And then um, the students were able to edit and make those smart contracts better. And I'll show you an example. Like I'll show you an example of that. Because some common errors they found were money leaks, and basically it's, it's a way for anyone to lose money. Um, they didn't really use the topography, and they had misaligned incentives. So here's an example. I'll make, uh, I pulled them both, but mainly pay attention to that one. On You're right. Um, that is that was one of the student submissions. That right there is a smart contract for a game of rock paper scissors. So basically, how it works is two players enter the game. They submit a hundred or a thousand way, and um, they have and they submit their choice along with that. And they use the matrix to determine who the winner is. And whoever the winner is gets the payout. Well, there are some issues with this contract. For example, um, one of the things they noticed was that a third player was trying to enter this game, they would not be able to because the maximum number of players would reach, so that third player would lose their money. That money would be that's what's called a money leak. But the money doesn't basically work the money doesn't really go anywhere. And also the other issue was if a, so you needed to enter in a thousand way, but if a user were trying to enter any other value than that, that money would also be leaked. So that was two of the issues, and that you know those are pretty smudged because you wouldn't really think of that when you're trying to create something like this because you would think, well, yeah, only two players can play rock paper scissors, and well, yeah.
you have to rely on the fact that they want to submit a hunch of waivers. You just never know. And if that happens, you know, again, the money really occurs. So that's why you kind of have to be careful when you're writing these smart contracts that you um, kind of cover your bases and nothing um, gets lost. And here was another um, example of a smart contract um, in 2017. Um, they want to use a decentralized internet voting system utilizing blockchain as a public bulletin board um, meant for only a small group of voters because there's a bunch of internet policy, um, internet, internet voting systems. We may want to see how blockchain can be used for this. So they also use a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. This is what I'm saying when I said that Ethereum is, Ethereum was basically designed to be a platform for you to write smart contracts and you to create your own blockchain applications. Um, it is decentralized, I mean, it is self-tallying. It is self-tallying, I mean, there is no need for a central tallying authority like in the previous solutions. Um, they had different design choices, um, and I'll show you the process. They use their process called the Open Vote Network. And so, you know, they have timers for um, efficient voting. You want to verify, it, it allows the user to verify the choice. Instead of it just getting written off, you don't really get to verify what you wrote. And also authenticates, authenticates the user. And so, um, how their process works is first of all, the administrator um, creates this list of voters, this list of eligible voters. In the paper, I would highly suggest um, if you're like in, into cryptography and all that, because they do go more into more detail about how their keys are formed, but I'm going to say they just need to kind of tell you what their process was. So, basically, it's a two round protocol um, where voters. Once the eligible list of voters is created, um, some voters register their keys, um, their voting keys that basically say, hey, I want to vote in this election. And the next, um, they commit, like I said, they commit their, um, they're using that key, they commit to the vote, and they submit their choice. In this um, particular example, they're only concerned with two choices of voting. So it's either yes or no. But using that, you can kind of, using the hash they Chosen like G is a agreed upon number that they use um, to vote. And then after you do all that, after the voting, voters are registered, and after they've submitted their choices, Ethereum can go ahead and compute the tally for them. And so, um, so that's just another example. Like I said, that paper kind of goes more detail about the photography of it all, but I just wanted to give you guys an example of like another how smart contracts are used on Ethereum. Uh, there's like many different examples of that. And so I highly recommend looking into how Ethereum can be used because it, it is pretty, it is very amazing how like just all the possibilities of Ethereum can be used for. And so now um, that's all the so that's all the papers I've read. But if you all want to try blockchain yourselves, I got some software that I was able to work with, and um, so there is something called a Kanash and Truffle Suite. So Truffle is basically a, um, just a collection of packages. But I mainly use it for to write and deploy my own smart contracts. Like when I was working last semester after I had done my paper, I wanted to kind of get some hands-on experience with it because I was, you know, I, I guess I understood it, but I was also like, how can I do this myself? So basically, um, you can write. So like I said, I wrote it in Solidity. Um, I learned how to write that. Like I said, it's pretty. It's an oriented programming languages. How it works is you write these functions that have certain data, certain fields, and those fields are added to the blockchain. And um, what, what Ganache can do is you're, it is basically like a synthetic environment, and, it's, and you can use it as your own personal blockchain. And you're able to see all the accounts associated with it, as well as like the code that gets written. And, uh, and MetaMask is basically a crypto wallet. Um, it's an extension that can connect web browsers to the Ethereum account. So what I was able to do is I was able to connect. This is a blood Ganache um, thing looks like. But like I said, that's fake. Um, 100 Ether. I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's money. It's a lot of money. I don't have that. But um, as you can see up top, I had used the, the top account because when I was testing, I was running my code. Um, it took some hours. So that was under. It took some hours. Down many one month because that was using gas. That was using the transaction fee. And um, and in Ganache. 
you, you're actually able to go and it shows the transaction and it shows the list of accounts. It also shows the data on the blockchain. The only problem I have with it though is you can use the console to kind of confirm the data, but when you're in this, it doesn't show it correctly. So for example, they have a, a data structure called mapping, which is like a hash table. And you know, I was writing to it, I knew for a fact there were values in it, but the, this was showing that there was it was empty. But whenever I would go to the console and type and do some test runs, it would say, oh hey, yeah, this is this value exists. It has something to do with the fact that Ganache doesn't really have access to that. But and also another weird thing is they it was really weird. When I would write numbers to the blockchain, they would like work not numbers, but like when I would do an array of numbers, for example, it would convert it to a string and make it hexadecimal. So but what besides that, I mean if you can convert to hexadecimal and um, you know you I would highly recommend if you want to Take your or take a stab at looking at your own personal blockchain without actually having to use Ethereum because Ethereum. I mean, like I said, when I was trying to look into Ethereum, I was trying to say, hey, I don't want to try and buy something. The minimum I could spend is like thirty dollars, and it was only giving like zero point zero 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 one. I'm like, in one Ethereum, one whole Ether was fifteen hundred dollars. So I'm like, okay. So if you want to like experience writing your own smart contracts without having to actually go through Ethereum itself and you can out, I would highly look into using Truffle and very helpful and also connecting using that mask because I was able to kind of create a kind of like a, kind of like a mini UI to kind of connect the web browser so when I would enter in I was able to see um, the account on the web browser using the better mask. And so basically um, this is um, so this is what me and Sales have been working on. We're trying to get my master's project into go and it's going to be using blockchain. Because at the beginning, I was wondering, this is kind of why I have looked into applications of blockchain, because I was wondering, am I going to create my own type of blockchain, or am I going to write a web program that utilizes blockchain? And so that's why I was kind of inspired to read um, different solutions of it. And so basically, for my master's project, we're trying to create an education system, kind of like, kind of like Imagine Canvas, but um, using, um, so the front end's going to be like a user interface, and the back end is going to connect to a blockchain. That's where all this data is going to be written. And we're also trying to work on using a, an extra credit system and where students can barter for their own bonus points and kind of have, like I said, one of those sub-currencies that I talked about earlier. And so we want to store all this um, information on the blockchain so that there's no discrepancies later on, such as, you know, student submissions, the grade, the credit, and the student information that might be sensitive. And one example I thought would be cool was when you submit something, have a kind of like a copy store on the blockchain because I'm sure we've all had horror stories where we've submitted something and the teacher said, I didn't get this work from you. So I thought that would be kind of cool and you can actually go through, look at the blockchain, oh hey, you did submit this work after this time. And um, and like I said, you know, I was able to write some smart contracts, but smart contracts would be the ideal thing, it would be the perfect thing for this because you know, once you write a contract, once you like click a button, you can run this contract, it'll get um, the student like so. In a way, like if you think of it like a cryptocurrency, you know, where you trade assets, you you submit your work, in exchange you get a grade. And maybe some bonus points depending on what you did. So if you like the way the bonus points system kind of works right now is it's still kind of kind of getting it together, but you know, if you get extra credit for turning work early, you get bonus points, you can also lose bonus points by doing negative things like turning work in late or cheating. You know, this kind of gives students a way to also barter. Like, if you're working on a group project or if you need help with somebody, say, hey, I, I can give you five bonus points or something. That's why we kind of want to write these smart contracts to kind of initiate, uh, um, initiate that. And that's all I have. Um, if anyone have any questions? I don't really know myself. Um, I know you. Can, I know you can. I'm pretty sure what you can do is kind of.
kind of change. It might be a MetaMask. No, actually, no. You can't, like, it doesn't have to necessarily be Ether. I think you can define your own kind of cryptocurrency, but I'm not really sure if there's a way you can change the validation. But I haven't really looked into that. It's very possible. There might, might also be something else that does it, but um, a lot of places will use proof of work. That's kind of like the most common thing is proof of work. Um, I, I know there's something called proof of authority and proof of stake. I didn't really look into those too much because, like I said, proof of work is really the most common thing. But, yeah, I'm not really sure, but that's a good question. You probably mentioned this, but what are the So, what are the downsides to using a blockchain versus a regular database? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> so, they don't really talk about the downsides a lot, but what I have seen is, um, I guess what could be a future downside is, for example, Bitcoin is growing really large. I think they're entering terabyte territory of how large that chain actually is. And I think that's kind of a problem. And I'm not really sure how they're going to deal with that. But I would say, like, as the size increases, you know, for something like, you know, that, um, the, the tourism example I gave, you know, I, I'll be honest, I don't really see a lot of people really contributing to that because those are kind of two separate worlds. Worlds. Even Dr. Seals was kind of having, I think he was having doubts about that one. I don't expect that one to grow very large, but like I feel like once you have something like Bitcoin that grows very, very large, it might become a problem. And also, um, you know, Bitcoin also takes 10 minutes to have it, to complete a transaction. So I feel like sometimes latency because of how big it is and for what it has to go through to add a blockchain, I feel like that is one of the major disadvantages. We still have time for one or even two questions. Can you plan to open source the project? Huh? Do you plan to open source the project? You are a master's project? Um, you know, I haven't thought about that, but I don't see why not. So, yeah, I can do that. I will try it. Um, like I said, we're trying to, um, it's still kind of, um, I don't want to say it's up in the air because, I mean, I haven't planned it out. Um, but I don't know, has anyone here used Vue.js? Do you know what Node.js is? Okay. So Node is like, you know, a JavaScript um, platform. And Vue is kind of where you can create your own objects and components and kind of use them. And that's what I was going to try and use for this project. Um, the, only, the only issue with, the thing about Ganache and Truffle is it is only a local blockchain. But I want to use this to where multiple people can access it at the same time. So if it's only a local blockchain, like, I don't know if I can. I could, like, for a project, say, use it and say, hey, yo, if we can, like, make this blockchain public, let's do it. But that's the thing with Ganache, it's only a local blockchain. So um, I forgot to mention that. So I'm going to try and find something else. I believe there are other things I could use. But, but yeah, as far as open sourcing, yes, I can. I don't see why not. I've never asked and never really thought about that, but honestly, because I think it would be nice. Because, like I said, I feel like blockchain, as disruptive as it is, I feel like you know, I feel like a lot of people don't know about it. Like I learned it for the, I learned about it for the first time over the internship, and I was kind of blown away. But actually, I was in a class at the beginning of last semester. Unfortunately, I did have to drop. That's kind of is what led me to make this project. But you know, I do feel like um, it's kind of an underrated. Technology as popular as it is, I feel like a lot of the students don't really know about it. Especially like once they learn to like like the lab did to create their own smart contracts, it can be really helpful. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, Mac has spoken very much for your interest in 